Welcome everyone to our webinar, ASH 2020 MDS Updates. Thank you for joining us. My name is Julie Powers and I'm the Senior Director of Patient Advocacy Programs at AAMDSIF and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I'd like to thank the generosity of our corporate sponsors and our patients, families, and caregivers for their support of our webinar today. Due to the high volume of conferences online, it is possible you might lose your connection during the webinar. If you're unable to view the webinar online, you can call in and listen using the call-in number that was in your reminder email. Today's program will also be archived to our website within two to three business days, but usually much sooner, and we'll send an email out when it's live and ready for viewing. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the box at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Um, if you uh, want to submit a question, you're welcome to do so. Just type your whole question in at once and then hit enter when you're done. We do ask that you do not include private health information about the patient in your question. Our presenter won't be answering specific questions related to your diagnosis or treatment. We'll try to get to all questions during the webinar, but we might not be able to get to everyone. If we don't get to your question, feel free to send it to us via email at help at aamds.org by calling our office at toll-free 800-747-2820, extension 2, or you can send us a messenger a message on Facebook Messenger. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Hetty Carraway. She is the director uh, of the Leukemia Program and vice chair of strategy and enterprise development at the Tossig Cancer Center, uh, and as well as an associate professor at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve. Dr. Carraway received uh, uh, let's see, received her medical degree from the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, Massachusetts. She completed her internship and residency in internal medicine and her fellowship in medical oncology at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. To complement her medical training, Dr. Carraway also earned an MBA from the Carey Business School at Johns Hopkins University in the business of health. As a translational clinical scientist, Dr. Carraway's research is focused on experimental therapies, therapeutics of acute leukemias and myeloproliferative diseases. With that said, welcome Dr. Carraway. Thank you so much. Um, can you all, can you hear me? I'm, yeah. I am. Oh, absolutely. And you can share your screen at any time. Thank you, Dr. Carraway. Of course. So with that, I'm going to launch into my discussion today on updates on MDS, and I'm so grateful for each and every one of you that have joined me today uh, and really appreciate the opportunity to give this talk. Um, I will encourage you all to uh, ask questions as uh, the more we're interactive, the more helpful this will be. I'm gonna move forward, and I'm, I did not really abbreviate many of these slides, so I welcome kind of input from all of you. and. Um, I'm excited to talk about kind of the updates in MDS and what's happening uh, with regard to research. I'm struggling a little bit with my ability to get to the next slide here. There we go. So our objectives today are to discuss the treatment algorithm for lower risk and higher risk MDS patients. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'd like to talk about some of the novel therapies. And I assume that many of you already have a great idea about kind of the spectrum of therapies that currently exist. Nonetheless, it will allow us to kind of highlight kind of the backbone therapy from which novel agents are being added to. And then we'll um, kind of spend a little bit of time going through some of the data to highlight uh, what we're excited about. In general, many of you know that the, there is an age-related incidence of MDS with increasing age. There's an increasing incidence of MDS. And we also can appreciate that the incidence is higher in males compared to females as depicted by this graph. Um, in general, it's associated with peripheral blood cytopenias as well as a variable risk of progression to AML. Many of you know we use an international prognostic scoring system that is REVISE. This is a version of the REVISE IPSS, where we give different scores uh, to different variables, variables being the chromosomes, the bone marrow blasts, and the number, the specific number, at the time of diagnosis for patients 
hemoglobin platelets and neutrophil count, that then using the combination of each of those scores tallies into a specific risk group from very low to very high. And based on that risk group, we can talk about the outcomes for patients, as well as what therapies we offer in each of those risk groups. And some of that data really shows us that the very low patients have a better survival and higher freedom from AML evolution. And those patients with higher risk scores have a lower survival and a higher likelihood of transformation to AML. And that really helps us to figure out which direction we might want to go in terms of therapeutic options. Our treatment goals in MDS, of course, for all of our patients, if there's an opportunity to cure MDS, we talk about that. But the realities of being able to get to transplant for many of our patients are mitigated by serious comorbidities, age, support systems, and other uh, confounding factors that make it sometimes not possible for patients to think about curative therapies such as transplant. We often focus on improving overall survival, lowering the risk of transformation to AML, and focusing on complete remission, hematologic improvement, stabilization of disease, decreased transfusion reliance, decreased uh, risks of infections, as well as supportive care measures that really focus on improving quality of life. For our patients with lower risk MDS, this is an algorithm that I put together for one of the talks for ASH, uh, which was a talk focused on the management of lower risk MDS. And for our patients that are in this category that are asymptomatic, we can often monitor these patients until we um, get to a point where there are symptoms or other cytopenias that really drive the need for intervention. Um, often our patients are met with Anemias that are managed by either erythropoietin agents or DARVO or Procrit or ESA based therapies or other mod uh, modes of, of support specific to patients that have deletion of chromosome 5Q, where we introduce agents such as lenalidomide. Um, for some of these patients, there is also now a new drug that was FDA approved for patients that helps to. Uh, decreased transfusion dependence for those patients with MDS in the presence of ring sideroblasts, and we'll talk about that in upcoming slides. Other patients can present with not just an anemia, but also issues with thrombocytopenia where the platelets are low or their neutrophils are low. And so there's a various number of um, pieces that we take into consideration when we're talking about therapies. Other treatment options for patients with lower risk MDS really can focus on this observation period, talking about what to expect, what symptoms should I expect, and what should I report on, when should I be worried about things, and what do I need to call my doctor about. Uh, we often focus on supportive transfusions, we talk about iron chelation, we talk about the use of growth factors to help stimulate the bone marrow factory, make a, a higher number of cells when there are deficient numbers of cells because of this entity that's happening in the bone marrow. Immunosuppressive therapy can be offered to patients. We don't talk about it all that often, but it can be effective in helping some patients, as well as the agents that I just touched on, lenalidomide and these patercept. And obviously bone marrow transplant for our patients can um, mean that there is a risk of morbidity and mortality in the upfront setting. And for that reason, many of our patients with lower risk MDS really not recommended that they move to a curative intent like bone marrow transplant given the cost benefit ratio. And so for many of our patients, bone marrow conversations around bone marrow transplant are really focused for those patients that have a higher risk MDS or lower risk MDS with high, high risk features. And, and so that is also something that I think. All right, so thank you everybody. I'm gonna move quickly to the ESA stimulating agents that we were touching on. Uh, as you know, many of our patients have anemia at presentation, and these agents are really paramount in kind of the upfront treatment, especially for those patients that are requiring transfusions. The response rates to ESA-based therapy is, ranges anywhere between 15 to 40 percent of patients, and there are uh, innumerable data kind of showing uh, safety and efficacy. With regard to um, this, this space for patients, 
um, we can actually try to use tools that help us predict who is most likely to respond to ESA-based therapy using a serum EPO level as well as the transfusion burden that patients have. And using the scoring system, we can identify if patients are likely to have a good response to ESA-based therapy or a poor response. Um, these agents, however, um, are not forever. They don't work forever. They can be durable up to 18 to 24 months in some patients, but ultimately we expect that um, the response to these types of therapies uh, will diminish over time. And we don't necessarily have a great way of predicting uh, that timeline for each patient. When ESA-based therapies are no longer effective, we can turn to agents such as lenalidomide, which as you know, looking at the right side, for those patients that have a cytogenetic abnormality of deletion 5Q, the likelihood of having a response of transfusion independence to pack red blood cells is about 80% for those patients that receive or take lenalidomide for 28 days in a row at 10 milligrams daily. Uh, for those patients that take a three-week duration of therapy, the likelihood of, of transfusion independence is about 60%. And for the majority of patients, up to 67% no longer need transfusions by the end of week 24. Ultimately, we learned and tested the use of lenalidomide in patients that do not have deletion 5Q and found that for about 25% of patients that um, receive lenalidomide where ESA-based therapy is no longer working, those patients can also gain transfusion independence. Um, this study was done in over uh, 240 patients looking at lenalidomide versus placebo and the majority of patients, about 90% of patients, responded within uh, four months of therapy, and the median duration of response was about 30 weeks. Ultimately, um, there are questions about whether or not you should combine lenalidomide with the ESA-based therapy to see if you can get a longer duration or a higher likelihood of response. And so data from Alan List uh, really helped us to kind of understand that maybe the combination would actually be better than single agent lenalidomide in such patients. But there was some uh, dissonance from the academic community because the control group didn't seem to do as well as we had otherwise expected. So I think this still to some degree, you'll notice that there may be practice differences and differences in recommendations around combination lenalidomide along with ESA-based therapy together. Um, there are some challenges with lenalidomide in its administration. Namely, patients can have a decrease in their other uh, counts, including their white count, their hemoglobin, and their platelets. And so you need to have a little bit of a titration happening depending on how each individual patient is tolerating this drug. I mentioned earlier that there are a subset of patients with MDS that have special cells that we identify as cells that have ring sideroblasts. And you can see in this picture to the right, the cells with this Prussian blue staining identifying cells with rings, rings around the nucleus that, that are described as ring sideroblasts. And so this particular entity that we have defined and is a special classification of patients called MDS with ring sideroblasts. And what we've learned is there's an association of these rings with the presence of a mutation called SF3B1. And so in general, you can, I can see here that there's a WHO classification system that we use to identify this subset of patients. Why is this important? These patients with this type of ring sideroblasts, there's now a new therapy called Boost Patercept that was recently FDA approved, number one. And number two, in general, those patients that harbor an SF3B1 mutation tend to have an MDS that is slower progressing. And so that's one of the genes that's actually really important to know about, um, not only because of it's slower to progress, but also because there's a new drug called Boost Patercept that's available to patients if they have um, not if they've lost a response to ESA-based therapy or are no longer um, or haven't responded to it in the first place. In general, this picture shows you that there are early cells that grow up and mature into a functional red blood cell. And this agent in green called Luce Patercept blocks this um, 
hormone, if you will, that prevents or inhibits the maturation of these red blood cells. And so this Patercept is kind of breaking that inhibition. And so by breaking that inhibition, you're allowing for that maturation to happen. This particular drug was studied um, in two uh, studies, one called the PACE study and the other called the Metalist study. The um, PACE study really identified the fact that patients with ring sideroblasts, you see here listed RS positive, and <clears throat> additionally, those patients with mutations of SF3B1, when we looked at the erythroid hematologic improvement or the, the, and the number of patients that were able to be free from uh, transfusions of red blood cells, we had the highest responses in those patients with ring sideroblasts with regard to erythroid improvement and transfusion independence, around 70% improvement in hematologic uh, erythroid line and about 40% transfusion independence in this population. Ultimately, that PACE study led to the Metalist study, which is a phase three study that randomized patients to receiving either loose Patercept or placebo. And in this particular study, focused on uh, ring sideroblast positive uh, MDS patients, they found that 38% of patients in the loose Patercept arm achieved transfusion independence for greater than two months versus 13% in the placebo arm. And so as a result, this led to the FDA approval of loose Patercept, and that was very exciting since we had not had a new agent that was FDA approved since um, 2006. Um, sometimes it's nice to go over cases. I wanted to briefly walk through this one case of a 62-year-old previously healthy man who presented with progressive fatigue and exercise intolerance. Um, ultimately present, identified to have a complete blood count that showed anemia with a hemoglobin of eight, a platelet count that was in the normal range, and a white count and a neutrophil count, both of which were in the normal range. He went on to have a bone marrow biopsy that showed 5% of these ring sitter blasts that we were talking about and had 2% blasts and was requiring transfusions, but not more than two units per month. He ultimately was diagnosed with a very low risk uh, uh, MDS. And because of the anemia and the transfusion requirements was started on ESA-based therapy. And after 12 weeks of being on therapy, he still maintained and required transfusion support. So the options to think about in this uh, space are some of the things that we've talked about already as listed here. Nonetheless, what are the newer options for him? He was unwilling to try lenalidomide because it was associated, it can be associated with a clot risk. And although that is more often in patients with multiple myeloma and not so much in our patients with MDS, but because he had had a bad experience in the family with clots, he wanted to pursue a clinical trial. He's now requiring six units of transfusions every two weeks. I wanted to highlight this drug, a metal stat, which is a first in class telomere or telomerase inhibitor with um, the thought that it can block the, the um, transformation of these malignant stem cells to progenitor cells. And it causes, a, it, it works as a potent competitor inhibitor of the telomerase activity. And this is really thought to have some disease modifying potential with, with selective killing of the malignant stem cell and progenitor cells and enables normal blood cell production. Uh, this study was presented by Dr. Plotzbacher at ASH. It's a phase two, phase three study design. To the left, you will see that enrollment was complete for the phase two portion of the study. And that is what Dr. Plotzbacher presented. The phase three study where this drug is randomized to placebo is ongoing and currently enrolling. In the phase two arm, you can see that low-risk MDS patients that were refractory to ESA-based therapy were enrolled to receiving a metal stat, and 38 patients received 7.5 milligrams per kilogram every four weeks. The primary endpoint of the study, what they were looking at was looking at transfusion independence. For the patients that were enrolled in the study, the median age was 71.5 years of age. Majority of patients were males at 
89% of the patients had a very good performance status where they were independent, able to do their activities of daily living. And again, you'll see that 89% of these patients that enrolled on the study had previously had exposure to ESA-based therapy. In general, when they evaluated transfusion independence, they could see that 42% of the patients that were enrolled in the study were able to become transfusion independent at the end of two months. In general, 32% of patients had transfusion independence for 24 weeks, and 30 or 29% of patients had one year of transfusion independence. So this is exciting data. They also learned that 68% of patients had an improvement in the red blood cell line, and 37% of patients had a major response to uh, uh, this agent with regard to uh, hematologic improvements and transfusion independence, and 55% of patients had a minor response. When they looked at complete remissions, there was a small percentage of patients, 11% of patients had a complete remission of their MDS, and 13% of patients had a marrow CR where the BLAST percentages were responsive to this uh, uh, telomerase inhibitor, a metal stat. Ultimately, they looked at the durability, what was the likelihood that patients had a durable response, and you can see in this, what they call a swimmer's plot, the duration of transfusion independence as highlighted by the green bar, and the gray bar that goes across is transfusion independence for less than eight weeks. Um, the longest transfusion-free period for any patient was 2.7 years, and for those patients that were transfusion independent, 75% of them had a maximum hemoglobin rise of greater than or equal to three grams per deciliter. Ultimately, the conclusions that Dr. Plotzbacher had at ASH felt, uh, demonstrated that a metal stat treatment shows meaningful and dur durable treatment transfusion independence, that it has potential disease-modifying activity, that there were very few concerns around safety, and that there was no new safety signal that was identified, and that they were moving forward with the phase three study, and we eagerly await that data. Ultimately, our, our patient here enrolled in the metal set study and achieved a hematologic improvement, and this was maintained for 10 months, but because ultimately the counts began to drop and the patient presented with increasing fatigue, um, he was removed from the clinical trial. His uh, counts continued to drop in all cell lines, and ultimately he was interested in enrolling in another clinical trial because of his good experience with the metal set. Other options, though, before considering a clinical trial would be immunosuppressive therapy, as I alluded to earlier. And you can see that this diagram shows you the options for patients with regard to ATG, another drug, plus um, prednisone, was used in 43% of this population of patients that was studied. Other patients got a combination of ATG and cyclosporin, and other patients received tacrolimus in combination with ATG or other agents such as a Tanercept or um, um, combinations of ATG, cyclosporin, and a Tanercept all, all combined. When thinking about immunosuppressive therapy, the overall response rates in general for patients that use this therapy is upwards of 48%, 11% of which is a complete response and the majority being stable disease as depicted in this chart by SD. And you can see 39% of patients benefiting from a stable disease, 32% of patients having some sort of hematologic improvement, whether it's in their red blood cell count, their platelet count, or their ability to fight infection, their neutrophil count. There are other emerging studies or therapies being investigated in patients for low risk MDS, and we'll talk about a few of these, APR246, which is a TP53 modifier, that is also being studied in the higher risk patient population, IDH inhibition, which we will also touch upon in the upcoming slides. This is an exhaustive list. I won't be able to go through all of this today in light of the time that we have. Um, one of the agents that's at the top of the list is another agent that's being studied to reverse or to, to decrease transfusion dependence in patients with anemia. 
And that is something that is also, um, you know, of interest. I highlighted the fact that some of our lower risk patients need to be, uh, that we worry about some of them. What are the things that we worry about? Progressive uh, symptoms in patients, newly acquired uh, cytogenetic or molecular abnormalities that may uh, indicate clonal progression or progression of the disease and specific mutations that we find more often in patients with leukemia as compared to MDS. For example, mutations of FLT3 or even of NPM1 that seem to occur more frequently, of course, in patients with AML. So if we see those types of mutations in a lower risk MDS patient, that would cause some concern. Again, I alluded to this earlier in our lower risk patients, we typically do not believe that they will benefit from transplant in the upfront setting. And so we've learned that transplant really doesn't offer an improvement in overall survival if given or provided earlier. But for those patients that receive transplant, ultimately, if, after they've gotten to a place of higher risk MDS, we really do believe that there is a benefit to that patient population with curative intent. And because of the different modalities of different kinds of transplants now, this now can reach patients with comorbidities, even with a lower heart function, or even other comorbidities that are going on that allow for reduced intensity transplants in patients that would otherwise previously have not been able to consider that modality. For our patient, if we turn back to kind of what's going on with, with him, uh, his BLAST percentage was evaluated by a biopsy and now shows that the BLAST are 13%. There are new chromosome abnormalities or changes that we see, as well as mutations that, again, are predictive of progression of this MDS to a more worrisome state. And so given this patient's positive experience with the prior clinical trial, he'd like to hear about any clinical trial options and novel combinations. And here we're going to be talking about kind of the backbone of therapy that we typically use, which is a hypomethylating backbone, whether it's azacitidine or decitabine, these <clears throat> are agents that we often offer to our patients with MDS, and now we're trying to add on another agent in order to improve the overall response, whether it's the re complete response, the hematologic improvement, and also improve the duration of that response. So you'll see that many of these studies are looking at those types of endpoints. Now, these may be out of order with regards to upcoming slides, and we'll talk a little bit about why we specifically are choosing certain drugs and adding them to that hypomethylating therapy backbone. Other therapies are listed here, and they're similar to the ones that we just talked about, and we will walk through each of these with the time that we have, and I promise to be mindful of that and try to not belabor or overwhelm you with too much uh, data. Um, ultimately, when we look at <coughs> the outcomes for patients, even on hypomethylating therapy, the AZA-001 study that was led by Pierre Fanot is depicted to the, on the right-hand side of the slide, and you can see patients that received azacitidine in the blue line had a better response with regard to receiving azacitidine compared to all the high-risk MDS patients that did not, that received either intensive chemotherapy and intermediate chemotherapy or best supportive care. And, and this really um, helped to underscore or demonstrate the improvement in overall survival for high-risk MDS patients that received um, hypomethylating therapy. The study to the left is a study that was led by Lou Silverman, and this study is the one that compared azacitidine to supportive care and led to the FDA approval of azacitidine, um, just because it also improved patients' quality of life uh, as well. Now, for specific patients, as we've talked about, we know that there can be mutations that are concerning and that we worry about the pro progression of high-risk MDS to something more aggressive, such as AML. And there's a specific mutation that we find in some patients that we really worry about called TP53. And so this is a pretty challenging patient population because it, this particular mutation <coughs> is um, one of those things that makes us worried because despite the therapies that we've previously given to many patients with this particular mutation, we, some ha we have had um, some learning experience in that 
despite the therapies that we've offered for patients, that particular P53 mutation still is persistent and will relapse and recur. And as a result of that, there have been investigators that have been focused on trying to target that mutation. And um, what that mutation does is it silences, you know, um, some of the cell's ability to stop growing. And so what this drug does is it reactivates that P53 mutation or that P53 gene so that the cell is then getting the appropriate signal to die. And so by reinitiating a normal gene or by reinvigorating that mutated gene to a more normal state, it, indi- it teaches that cell to go ahead and naturally die and, and disappear. <clears throat> so this is actually quite provocative and very exciting. And as a result of this function, they use this drug, APR246, which is this P53 modulator, and added it to the backbone of azacitidine and studied it in 45 patients, 33 of which were diagnosed with MDS, eight of which were diagnosed with AML, and four of which were diagnosed with MDS, MPN overlap, or CMML. And you can see that the overall response rate as highlighted by the red circle was 88% in the 33 MDS patients, and the CR rate was 61%. 52% of patients discontinued the study because they were then able to move towards curative therapy with a transplant. And again, you can see in this figure, the swimmer spot where we're looking at treat, you know, durability of the treatment response. The green bars again, indicating those patients that are in complete remission, and then other colors indicating a hematologic improvement or some sort of hem- other hematologic improvement or leukemia free state. There is an ongoing pivotal phase three study for those patients that have TP53 mutated MDS, and you can see here the target enrollment of 154 patients, randomizing patients again to either AZA monotherapy or AZA mono, AZA therapy with APR246. This study met the, the enrollment um, endpoint and looked at the primary endpoint, which of complete remission rate. And unfortunately, the complete remission rate, was, although it was higher in the combination arm, it did not reach statistical significance. Um, the investigators and the, the study uh, sponsor are looking at this data to try and make heads or tails of the data that have come from this study. Just because of its um, biological mechanism of action, people still remain very excited about it although the design of the study uh, meant that it needed to um, close because it did not meet its primary, uh, it, 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 it was less, uh, I think, exciting in that it didn't meet its primary endpoint. And so as a result of that, I think people were somewhat deflated, although I think there still remains a large interest in this particular agent. We'll see what next steps uh, the sponsor takes. Another agent that is important for you to be aware of is an agent that targets CD47. And CD47 is a surface marker on top of the cells that is a signal to say, don't eat me. And so many of the um, cancer cells can get the CD47 marker on it or surface marker so that the immune system does not recognize it and eat it and eliminate it. And so it's a survival mechanism uh, such that it teaches the body or allows the body to not recognize that cancer cell and eliminate it. And they know that the, there is increased CD47 expression even in cases of acute myeloid leukemia. So if you can target this particular surface marker and eliminate that cloak, if you will, then the body would recognize those cells and eliminate them in and of, on, on their own. So ultimately, this agent, magrolimab, which is an anti-CD47 drug, uh, was used in combination with the backbone hypomethylating therapy, azacitidine, and was found to induce a high remission rate in patients with MDS and AML, as depicted in the chart there. You can see there were 33 patients that had MDS and 25 patients that had AML, And the overall response rate was 91% in those patients with MDS with a 42% complete remission rate. 
um, this particular drug, the median time to response was almost two months, and the efficacy compared favorably to ASA monotherapy in these upfront studies. Um, finally, I wanted to kind of highlight that it also seemed to be relatively exciting in our patients that had TP53 mutated MDS with an overall response rate of 75% and a 50% complete remission rate. Um, and so this also was, was pretty um, provocative and very exciting, especially knowing what we know about um, this higher risk uh, patient population with this mutation. And looking at the swimmers plot, you know, you can see the green boxes again are depicting those patients that are having a durable complete remission. And then the yellow boxes are depicting the stable disease. For these patients that were on this study, the, all of the patients, all 43 patients had, 68% of patients had transfusion independence. And for those patients with TP53 mutations, 63% of those patients had transfusion independence. Ultimately, the median duration of response was around 9.6 months for all patients enrolled and 7.6 months for those patients that had TP53 AML. Um, so this, again, was a very exciting uh, agent and something to look, for, look, look towards as uh, further studies are ongoing. Other agents that are important to consider are the combination of venetoclax, a BCL2 inhibitor, which is an oral medication that is given in combination, again, with the backbone of hypomethylating therapy in higher-risk MDS patients. This is a study that was presented by Garcia. 78 patients were enrolled in this study, and the primary objectives initially were really to figure out what the best dose of venetoclax would be and how it would be tolerated. The study design is as depicted here, looking at different durations of therapy and dose escalation, and then, of course, looking at the safety of the combinations in patients. Again, these patients that enrolled on the study were not allowed to have prior therapy, and they were um, patients that were not patients that had were able to go undergo uh, transplant. Looking at response rates, you can appreciate here the overall response rate being 79%, 39.7% of which is complete remission. The median duration of response after complete remission was 13.8 months, and the median time to complete remission was 2.6 months. There were a number of patients that had a transfusion independence after being on this con combination. And you can see 65% of patients were able to achieve a transfusion independence for both red blood cells and platelets, 67% red blood cell transfusion independence and 77% tra uh, pla platelet transfusion independence. Even though patients that were ineligible for transplant were required to kind of enroll in the study, there was a subset of patients that were able to move towards uh, transplant. Looking at the overall survival of patients in both the blue and the green line, those represent patients that had combination therapy, but the venetoclax dosing was different in each of those arms, and the survival estimates being upwards of 76.8% for 12-month uh, survival and 59.6% for two-year overall survival. Ultimately, Garcia, uh, his thoughts in, in this presentation were that then ASA combination therapy demonstrates efficacy, durability, and, and an acceptable safety profile. And an ongoing study called the Verona study is randomizing patients to receiving either azacitidine monotherapy or combination venetoclax plus azacitidine. And again, this is being studied in newly diagnosed patients with high-risk MDS that have not yet received therapy. And so we eagerly await that, those results. Another drug that was presented by Dr. Sekaris uh, looked at a drug called Pevaninostat and used that in combination with, under, with the backbone therapy of azacitidine. Pevaninostat is a novel inhibitor of a NED8 activating enzyme. And this enzyme is thought to block ubiquitination of select pro proteins upstream of the proteasome. And that can disrupt cell cycle progression and cell survival and lead to cell death of the cancer. And so it was uh, this particular study that Dr. Sekaris presented at ASH uh, 
was looking at a phase two study where higher risk patients, there were 67 patients that were randomized to receiving either monotherapy with azacitidine or combination pevonidostat plus azacitidine. And the study was powered on event-free survival as the original primary endpoint. And ultimately, um, though the, the primary endpoint was changed to overall survival based on regulatory feedback because they want to be able to move this combination if it's effective uh, and have it be available to patients. This uh, presentation, again, is focused only on the phase two data for these 60 some odd patients. And you can see here, the combination arm was 32 patients and the azacitidine monotherapy arm was 35 patients. The median age was 70 to 75. You can see here the event-free survival and overall survival was better for those patients that received combination therapy. And that is reflected in the red line compared to the placebo to the monotherapy arm being the, the gray line uh, for those patients receiving azacitidine only. You can see in the boxes here, the median EFS for combination therapy was 20.2 months compared to 14.8 months for azacitidine only. And the overall survival for combination therapy was 23.9 months compared to 19.1 months for those re receiving combination versus monotherapy respectively. Um, Interestingly, the longer EFS was particularly evident in patients with the uh, the very high risk MDS patients and the very and the high risk MDS patients, and so that is also really provocative because you want to be able to help those patients with the highest level of risk uh, with regard to progression of disease. They also were able to demonstrate and shared with us that the combination had better complete remission rate as well as a longer duration of remission as depicted here by these uh, bars. And you can see that the overall response rate and the CR rate here depicted in the pevonidostat plus AZA versus AZA overall response 79% with combination and overall response 57% with monotherapy. The median time to first CR complete remission or partial remission among responders was 3.83 months with combination and 4.2 months with azacitidine. And looking at this uh, bar graph across the top, you can see the duration of response being longer for combination therapy at 34.6 months versus azacitidine at 13.1 months. Transfusion independence was also apparently improved more in combination therapy as compared to monotherapy, and the median time to AML transformation was delayed in, our, in the patients with higher risk MDS, more, uh, more of an impact in those patients that received combination therapy compared to uh, monotherapy. Ultimately, also looking at adverse events, it did seem that there was similar adverse events and manageable adverse events in both the monotherapy and combination arms. And the portfolio in terms of what types of mutations different patients had, this combination therapy was effective across all different a spectrum of mutations. And so ultimately, Dr. Sekaris uh, shared with uh, us at ASH that there was encouraging efficacy with combination therapy and really exciting data on longer EFS, encouraging overall survival and clinical activity, even in patients with TP53, as well as a spectrum of other mutations. There is now an ongoing phase three cancer study of combination therapy that is fully enrolled. And we're uh, really kind of waiting with bated breath to see uh, what this data shows. I want to turn quickly to another drug called Tim, uh, sabatolumab, which is a TIMP3 inhibitor. And this particular inhibitor can be helpful in attacking both the immune effectors and getting them to work better, as well as impacting the leukemic cells. And so this TIMP3 inhibitor can work in a dual manner to then impact and eradicate the underlying cancer itself. And this was a phase 1B study that was presented by Dr. Berner looking at combination sabatolumab plus the hypomethylating agent, either azacitidine or decitabine. And you can see here that sabatolumab was given at different doses, 240, 400, 800, 
on day eight and day 22. And different patients got different dosing, trying to understand what is the best tolerated dose that helps bring the most effective response. And so um, with that, really looking at safety and tolerability of the combination. You'll see varying responses here. I want you to focus on the very high risk and high risk MDS population here with 41 patients that were enrolled, 19 of which that received combination with decitabine and sabatolumab, and 22 uh, that received azacitidine and sabatolumab. Median age of patient was 70. 56% of those enrolled were males. The ECOG performance status told us that many of the patients were independent and able to do all of the, their functioning skills on their own. The majority of patients, of course, having very high risk and high risk MDS. In this study, um, patients ultimately did have to come off of study because of progressive disease, but uh, importantly, there were very few adverse events when evaluating patients on this study. So the tolerability of combination sapitolumab with azacitidine was excellent. Um, there were some patients that had at least one treatment-related immune adverse event because this is thought to kind of stimulate the immune response to cancer. And there were no grade four or five treatment-related immune adverse events. Ultimately, looking at the response rates here, you can see, again, I'm going to have you focus on the left-hand side of the slide, looking at the very high-risk and high-risk MDS patients in kind of the navy blue section. Again, overall response rates in this population of 64.1%, with 23.1% being complete remissions. Looking at our swimmers plot here, you can see for those patients that these responses for many patients were quite durable with two months being, uh, the, in general, the median time to response, 83.9% of patients still in response after six months, and a 51.9, 12-month progression-free uh, survival rate. And nine patients of the 30-some-odd patients were able to proceed to transplant. Again, um, this a combination seemed to be very um, promising, especially in our very high-risk MDS patients, and also showing that these responses were durable. So again, uh, this seems to be a very important combination for us to know and learn more about. Uh, Dr. Brunner uh, concluded that sabatolumab could be safely combined with either azacitidine or decitabine, and that there were no additional adverse events in using a combination approach with therapy. There was promising durability of the responses that were observed not only in the MDS population, but also in the AML population with an estimated six-month duration of response of 83.9% in MDS and 78.8% in those patients with AML. Um, ultimately, you can see here that there are ongoing studies with uh, sabatolumab looking at the higher risk MDS patients and also in patients that are AML, diagnosed with AML, that are unfit for intensive chemotherapy. And we eagerly await results from these studies as well. There are targeted therapies such as ivacidinib for IDH1 mutated MDS, which is also pretty promising, 75% overall response rate with 41% CR rate. And then targeting IDH mutations is also possible. And the reason why these are important is because these are oral regimens that are well tolerated. Patients don't have to come to clinic to get any kind of infusion as long as they are being monitored appropriately with their local hematologist or their uh, hematology oncologist. And acitinib is the name to the oral agent that is an IDH2 inhibitor. And um, for some of these patients, you can see uh, on the chart the swimmer's plot showing that the durability of response as well as the overall survival and the tolerability of this was also quite exciting. So ultimately, this cartoon here teaches you a little bit about the green boxes that we talked about today, some of the exciting agents that are emerging for the treatment of higher risk MDS that we're really looking forward to some of the results from the phase three studies that will teach us about the true uh, real outcome of combination therapy in comparison to either placebo or to standard of care.
Um, there are many uh, combinations that are likely to emerge in the upcoming future, uh, not the least of which are the ones that we've talked about today. Um, but I think in conclusion, I want to share with you and highlight the fact that we're getting better at refining our understanding of each of the classifications for our MDS patients with regard to the mutation profiling. We have newer therapies that were just FDA approved, such as loose patercept. We have this hypomethylating therapy backbone, which I didn't even get to talk about some of the oral hypomethylating therapies that are now going to also be bringing have brought forth to our patient population and used in combination with some of the agents that we talked about today. And, you know, we're really excited about some of the upcoming data that we'll see in these phase three studies. So um, hopefully there's more to come and share with each and every one of you. And I ultimately just want to share and encourage you and thank you for considering any uh, possible or encouraging others to enroll in clinical trials uh, for, for uh, patients that have a diagnosis of MDS because we need to have better outcomes and better agents for the management of this disease. So with that, I want to thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take a few questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Carraway, for your wonderful presentation and thorough overview of MDS and the latest treatments uh, that are promising. We have a few questions, a few that were submitted in advance, as well as several that have come in through the Q&A. So let's get started. Um, our first question is, do you have any suggestions on treatment options for patients with MDS that's unspecified who is transfusion dependent and has failed Procrit, Videza, and loose patercept Yeah, so um, this is a great question, right? So it's just like the things that we talked about in terms of patients that are requiring transfusions that no longer are responding to ESA-based therapy or loose patercept or videza. And I would ask, you know, has there been any opportunity to consider using lenalidomide, which is the oral agent uh, that we talked about in some of the initial slides after we talked about ESA therapy. So there's a 20 to 25% likelihood that there may be some transfusion independence that happens by getting this oral medication. Um, and so that would be something that I would consider doing. But I think the first step I would probably consider is a clinical trial if there are any in your area with a particular attention to some of the things that we've even talked about today. Um, ultimately, for many of our patients that have MDS, we worry about anemia and we worry about all of the things that can contribute to anemia. So I often in a setting like this dial back and make sure that any of the things that I can fix, I try to fix whether it's the thyroid, whether it's the iron level, whether it's a vitamin B6 level, uh, looking carefully at all of the causes that can be a contributor to needing transfusion support. So I often double back and just recheck, like have I thought about every single thing that we can potentially fix and then think about what clinical trials may be an option and consider uh, lenalidomide as also part of that entity if clinical trials are not part of the uh, possible options. Thank you so much. We have a question from someone uh, who wanted to follow up on one of your presentations. I know that azacitidine plus magrolimab is in a phase three trial. Do you have any sense of when that combination might be finally approved for use? Yeah, I, um, I do not have any timeline uh, that I could share with anybody with regard to when that may or may not transpire. So um, I do not know how to guide um, the timeline or, or answer that question. I think many of the, the things that happen in that space really um, are in the hands of the sponsor as well as the FDA. And so it would be uh, hard, hard for me to kind of answer uh, honestly. Thank you so much. We have a question. Um, uh, we have a, a patient who added EPO uh, uh, darbopoet and alpha shots to their ongoing Bidesa, um, but the white blood cell and ANC counts continue to drop after 32 months after stability, to new lows. Any, any thoughts? So my understanding of the question is, um, I'm assuming that there are low white counts, low hemoglobin, 
and the patient has been on vidaza based therapy in combination with darbopoietin. And after about 32 months, the concern is that the counts are starting to drop. The white count, it sounds that, like that, only the white count. White count and ANC, they said, have dropped after 32 months. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's hard. We only get we only get a small snapshot, but any direction we might go that, in, doctor? Yeah, so this can happen, and I do like this question. You can tell that this patient has been on Bidaza-based therapy for over two years. And so at some point after being exposed to this, there are questions that I would have in this scenario if the white count and the neutrophil counts are dropping, I would be interested in getting a bone marrow biopsy to look at the cellularity of the bone marrow to see what's going on there. It can be with cumulative repeated events of this chemotherapy that you might need to look at the cellularity and see if the bone marrow is really just taking its own sweet time to recover between cycles. And so getting a bone marrow biopsy, unfortunately, is typically what I would do in this scenario to help inform what might be the next best move. If the bone marrow is full of cells, we might need to change therapy. If the bone marrow is empty, we might need to prolong the pause in between the cycles of therapy or modify the doses. And so we don't know unless we kind of take a, a, a peek at the bone marrow to see what's really going on there. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got a, a several sometimes more questions. Patients start using, yeah, sometimes patients start using GCSF in that setting, but I would not recommend doing that until we know what's going on in the marrow. Thank you so much. I'm going to try and just uh, squeeze in a couple more questions. Uh, I know we need to let you go. You've got to get back to clinic, but um, we yeah, I have a you have patients so I'll call already. That's okay. All right, so we're going to we're going to wrap it up with um, I I I will um, anyone who posts a question just send us your question to help at AAMDSIF. But I just wanted to answer this one last question live, uh, Doctor Caraway, which is um, when you refer to complete remission, do you re mean complete remission while on the drug or post clinical trial? We'll close out on that. I one. mean, complete remission on the drug. So this, any of these studies, patients have to be receiving the therapy and we're, and we're evaluating those patients for response. And if they're responding to that therapy, they are staying on that therapy to maintain that response. So it's not that they took the agent and now they're done. It's that they're continuing on that therapy and then we need to assess for the response to that therapy. Thank, Thank you, you for so asking that question. Yeah, no, it's really important to understand what that means. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Dr. Caraway, and thank you to everyone for your time and attention and, and your patience as we were dealing with technology. If we didn't get to your question today, and I know there are several still outstanding, and my apologies, but you can send that question over to us at help, H-E-L-P, at aamds.org. You can give us a call, uh, or you can send us a question on our Facebook page via the messenger. On behalf of the foundation, I want to thank you all for joining us today and making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. The AAMDS Medical Advisory Board, Board of Trustees, staff, and, uh, and volunteers are all here to help you and your family as we have been for the last 37 years. This concludes today's program. Thank you again, Dr. Caraway, and thank you all for being with us today. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Bye.